Welcome back to Grumpy Old Grognard's Attic. I know I've been away for a long time, and I did warn you a long time ago that that was going to be the case. I was just going to disappear for months on end. Uh, this was a particularly serious, like, real-life issue, uh, which has a happy ending so far. So that's good. Uh, and it's got, got, got a little time to make a video. All kinds of things have happened, and I might just do some back-time videos, because... But I'm, I'm not ragging on Wizards of the Coast. Looks like I guess I am this time, but not directly, okay? Uh, maybe a little bit. <laughs> uh, and Lord knows they deserve it. They, they've had their shenanigans on. And they just can't seem to do anything right. Like, everything they do is just stupid. And now they're doing it to Magic the Gathering, too, which I gotta tell you. And it's not Wizards of the Coast anymore, let's be honest. It's, it's Hasbro. Okay, there's no such thing as Wizards of the Coast anymore. They're middle management now. They do what Hasbro tells them to do. So it's Hasbro. And they've always been kind of skeevy. Um, let's talk about, and I know I've been studiously avoiding this subject, uh, but let's face it, politics has reared its ugly heads into my games again. And... I feel the need to answer to it. A lot of people have been asking me about my feelings about woke. So I've got another answer that is going to piss you off. And it doesn't matter who you are. It's going to piss you off. Okay? I think wokeism is bullshit. I think it's bullshit on both sides of the aisle. I think you're all full of shit, okay? I think this is just more abject nonsense that the people in power, the powers that be, the corporate masters, the overlords of the nation are willing to let you argue about because it won't cost them any money. <laughs> and as long as they keep us squabbling amongst ourselves, we're not going to be worrying about little things like making sure everyone's got enough food to eat or health care or can afford a decent education. That's what I think. I think wokeism is bullshit. And if you have adopted wokeism as your cause, congratulations. I think you're an idiot. But if I must land on a side, I'm going to land on the side that no, I can't. I can't land on a side because you know what? Woke is good. Woke is good. Accepting people, being diverse and inclusive, that stuff's good. I agree with that. Uh, letting biological men use the bathroom in a girl's middle school. Okay, so we're going to argue about that. Okay? But for the most part, woke is good. Diversity is good. Uh... I'm all for it. But at a certain point, I don't care. When there's a cop standing on my neck in the street, all I care is about is the boot. I really don't care about the color of the foot inside it. So I got to tell you, if your idea of diversity and inclusion means uh, you know, more female drone pilots, then you and I are not on the same page. Okay, But for the most part, woke is good. My problem with the wokeism movement as it occurs today is that the people involved have no interest in persuading, in changing anything. They're just a bunch of virtue signaling dickheads. 
That's what you are. You're a bunch of virtue signaling dickheads. How do I know? Because I know how to persuade people. And you don't persuade people by calling them, oh, let's just say, virtue signaling dickheads. Okay? That's not how you, how you don't feel persuaded, right? You don't feel at all persuaded. But the simple truth is that if you want to persuade somebody, you don't persuade them by calling them deplorable. You don't persuade somebody by calling them racist or sexist. You don't persuade somebody by silencing them, okay? Which is pretty much what this whole wokeism thing about is about, right? Shaming and silencing the people that you don't agree with. Okay. You persuade people by interacting with them. You persuade people by being with them. You persuade people by talking with them. And if you call somebody a Nazi, they're not going to want to talk to you. So the fact that y'all are all bent on, hell bent on, deplatforming people and calling them racists or fascists or whatever your thing is, you, you, you're you're not trying to persuade people. Okay? What you're trying to do is divide people. Okay? And that is playing into the corporate overlord's hands. That's what they want you to use this for. So uh, from where I sit, if you're a wokist, you're full of shit. <laughs> okay? That word used to have a completely different meaning. You know, Ten years ago, and I proudly said, yeah, I'm woke. You know, I understand that we don't really have a democracy in this country. I understand that corporations pretty much run both parties and that no matter who you vote for, whether they're wearing a blue tie or a red tie, it's going to be the same people in the background making the actual decisions. That's what woke meant 10 years ago. Okay? That's not what it means anymore. <laughs> right? But now it's, well, I don't even, I'm not even going to get into it. You know what it means. I know what it means. Now, what I wanted to talk to you to about today does touch on this subject. Uh, because I'm going to show you the difference between being woke and being awake. Okay? Because being woke is just bullshit. Okay? If you want to take a good look at the bullshit of wokeness, let's head on over to Drive Through RPG and let's look up. The Disclaimer on the World of Greyhawk. We, wizards, recognize that some of the legacy content available on this website does not reflect the values of the Dungeons & Dragons franchise today. Some older content may reflect ethnic, racial, and gender prejudice that were commonplace in American society at that time. These depictions were wrong then, and they are wrong today. This content is presented as it was originally created, because to do otherwise would be the same as claiming these prejudices never existed. Dungeons and Dragons teaches that diversity is a strength, and we strive to make our D&D &D products as welcoming and inclusive as possible. This part of our work will never end. If you buy this, you're a racist piece of shit. Tell you a little something about Gary Gygax. Gary Gygax created a diverse and inclusive racial diversity in the very first Dungeons & Dragons campaign setting which is one of the many reasons that Wizards of the Coast hates it so much. Here's the difference between woke and awake. Woke is stupid. Awake is aware, okay? In woke, looking right at you, rings of power. In woke, we're gonna pretend that race doesn't exist. It's not a thing. We're just gonna have a little colony of these of these uh, 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 
hobbits that have been living together and inbreeding and traveling the road together for centuries. And they're going to be Chinese and they're going to be black and they're going to be white and they're going to be the Mediterranean and they're going to be, well, you know, what? Okay, that's not woke. That, that's not awake. That's not aware. That's just stupid. Okay? It's just stupid. Awake means being aware and not being stupid about it. And that's what Gary Gygax did when he wrote The World of Greyhawk. <laughs> Let me show you how Gary Gygax treats the world of Greyhawk. Uh, I'm going to clear off my desk here, and I'm going to point, do, so, do some of the whole pointy thing because I kind of explored the idea of doing an animation, and it's a royal pain in the ass, and I just don't have time for that shit. And here we are. Now, as much as I'm loathe to do this, uh, we are going to use the third edition Gazetteer map because the first edition Gazetteer map is, well, fucking huge and we can't use it. So, this one barely fits on my desk. Forgive the clutter, but frankly, on this computer, this desk has not been used for anything other than computers in a very, very long time. So I just did my best to clear it off, but the simple truth is it's a mess. So let me orient this towards the camera as best I can. Okay, this is the Flané. Now, why is it called the Flanaeus? It's called the Flanaeus because this is the homeland of the Flan. I'm going to go ahead and try to give you a closer look. The Flan, here you go. The Flan is basically occupying this whole area at the beginning of the Greyhawk histories, okay? The only other uh, ethnic groups that you'll find even remotely represented on this map are the Sulois. The Sulois are, frankly, they're the scumbags uh, on this map. They're down here, okay? This area. And then there's the Aird here. Okay? Now, the, uh, the, please understand that Gary Gygax's ethnic groups did not have direct uh, analogs in reality. Okay? They are, in fact, unique human races. But I'm going to do my best to kind of translate them into reality as best I can to shorten the discussion as much as I can. And most of all, to illustrate how this setting is the most ethnically diverse and inclusive that has ever been written that wasn't done stupidly, okay? Because in this game, in this setting, ethnicity is a thing. Race is a thing, okay? But let's get to the end result, and I think you'll be a little surprised at what the end result is here. Okay, so we have the Sewell living down here on the other side of the Hell Furnaces. We've got the Aird, the Airdians living here in the dry steppes on the far side of the Crystal Mist Mountains uh, and here to the Yatio Mountains. That's Aird. And here we've got all Flan. Analogs. The Sewell are basically the Nordic white people. Okay, very white skin, red hair, blonde hair, blue eyes. These are the, these are these guys. Okay, uh, the Aird are more Mediterranean stock. Uh, they are olive skinned. They are uh, they are uh, uh, dark haired, dark eyes. Uh, you know, basically, these are your Mediterranean stock. This whole area here is basically, the humans that live here are basically black, okay? Uh, now, because of their proximity to the Aird, they are probably the most diverse at the beginning of the game in terms of copper-skinned all the way to dark, dark bronze, okay? Uh, 
so these are the flan, the flan, and this is the Flaneus, and this is the continent where the world of Greyhawk takes place. There's one other ethnic group that we need to talk about. They're not on this map yet. They will arrive at some point, but they're off to the west, and they are the uh, Becklin, the Becklinish. And the two main players at the very beginning of the game are the Sulu Sulois and the Beklunsh off on the other on the far side of the map. These are the superpowers of their day, capable of immense magics, which are literally uh, have evolved to the point now where they are weapons of mass destruction. And these two forces are constantly at war with each other. This war ends when the mages of the Sul Suluis bring down what's called the Invoked Devastation on the Beklunish Empire, which completely destroys it. And in response, mutually assured destruction, baby, the, uh, the uh, Beklunish wizards cast what's called the Reign of Colorless Fire, which renders the entire Sulois Empire into what is now the Sea of Dust, renders it into a desert, okay? This is when the migrations begin, okay? Now, they actually do start a little earlier than I've said. I'm kind of oversimplifying the history here to make the point that we're going to get to at the end, which I personally find hysterical because it's going to piss all y'all off. Okay? So, what happened then is what was left of the Baklunish started, and, and the, the devastation itself forced the Airds to start migrating across the, uh, the, uh, the uh, western side of the Flanais. Okay? It also forced the Sulois up into the uh, up into the. This is called the Sheldamar Valley in the Flanais. Okay, and those two did not get along well at all. Fortunately, uh, the uh, the Erdians were not particularly nice people. They were the Erdians were always a very aggressive tribal group, but they did spend most of their time fighting amongst each other, okay? The Flanay, totally peaceful, spirit worshippers, no conflicts, no wars. They lived in peace with the other de the demi-humans here. This place was lousy with demi-humans before the migrations. Uh, elves, dwarves, gnomes, hobbits, all of them living here together in peace without any aggravation from these folks over here, okay? But then the migrations begin, okay? The Erdians come from this direction. The Sulois come from this direction. The Sulois are terrible. They are slavers. They are liars. They are cheaters. They are thieves. Uh, the Erdians are violent, but they have a sort of a code of honor that they live by. So, and, and as a rule, they don't get along too well with the Flanea. But they do get along pretty well with the Ulv and the Dwer and the other demi, the, the elves and the dwarves and the gnomes and the hobbits that live here. They actually do get along pretty well with them. Uh, they trade with them. They get along with them. They defend them against the Sulois, which kind of makes the Erds a dominant force in the Sheldamar Valley. Uh, this forces the Sulois to continue moving, if you know, just cutting through the flan and moving east, okay? So, where does that leave us? That leaves us with uh, the Airds coming in, coming in this way, the, uh, the uh, Sulois getting pushed further and further to the east and to the south, okay? And it also includes some newcomers, some survivors of the Baklunish Empire, along with the Airds, start coming in here along this northern border, 
and they cut all the way to the wastes, the barren wastes, which are right here, okay, where they actually, the flan actually turned them around. Now, how do these peaceful people do that? Well, over the hundreds of years that have taken, that have occurred since this devastating war over here, uh, the, uh, the, the flan have survived as an ethnicity, but their, their culture has been completely obliterated. In order to survive this onslaught from the West, uh, the, the flan have had to adopt uh, higher technology. They've had to start forging steel, armor, weapons, and they've had to adopt a feudal society. So they have the hierarchical command structure necessary to feel the kind of armies that they need to defend what's little is left of their positions. <clears throat> So there is actually, even to this day, there's a band of uh, uh, flan right here uh, that have managed to maintain to some tiny degree, maybe their cultural identity, but definitely their racial, racial identity. Uh, but for the rest of the Sheldamar Valley down here, almost all of the Sheldamar Valley down here, uh, the area is now conflicted between what's left of the Flan, who are eventually going to get pushed all the way into Geoff, uh, the Sulois, and the Airs, who, because they are not utter utterly incapable of maintaining an alliance with anybody, are actually begin to dominate in the Sheldamar Valley. And to this day, Erdian uh, culture and Erdian uh, uh, ethnicity kind of dominates in the Sheldamar Valley which pushed the fight here, okay? Now, the Erdians, like I said, very aggressive. At this point, they've kind of evolved a bit beyond the tribal. They've become more feudal, like I said, in order to, in order to, to maintain these, mili these huge militaries that they needed in order to, to maintain this conflict. Uh, these are the only, the only people that ever actually maintained any kind of tribalism were the the Sulois, uh, who basically maintained their tribalism by continuing to flee from the more organized attacks of the Aird, okay? So the Aird continued to push the Sulois all the way up into the Coruscant Griff Mountains here, where they become uh, the Frost Barbarians, the Snow Barbarians, the Ice Barbarians, okay, up here, and all the way down into the uh, Scarlet Brotherhood here, this is this area down here is, is mostly Sulois. And again, all the way down into the Amedio jungle, okay? So the, where nobody was living before. Uh, it's literally a, a wilderness at the beginning, and then the Sulois move in there. Uh, there's a lost civilization there, but that's long gone at the beginning of this, this war. So now we have that the, the, the strongest Erdi, the strongest uh, uh, Erdians who call themselves A-I-R-D-Y, the Erdi, okay, uh, down into this area here, okay? This is going to become the Great Kingdom. It's going to, which would be here. It's not on this map because this is a newer map, but there would be the Great Kingdom, Nyrond, all these areas in here, okay? Are now now taken over by the the most power the House of Rax, the House of Rax is the most powerful, uh, uh, is is the most powerful, Erdian noble house, uh, and basically that becomes the uh, the racial kind of status quo of modern Greyhawk. So let's take a look at this on a different map. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, I couldn't do an animation, but this is what the first edition uh, map looks like. And if we superimpose these pages, uh, the map from these pages in Greyhawk, which nobody ever bothers to read, because quite frankly, until you kind of get your teeth into them, they're kind of boring. Uh, but there is this little map on here. Let's just superimpose this right here. And this will show you the areas where uh, the migrations have kind of created this 
ethnic melting pot. Oh no, melting pot. Did you say melting pot? Yes, it's an ethnic melting pot all throughout this area, okay? Where you can reasonably find people of the Aryan, Baklunish, Flannish, uh, or Sulois races, okay? And also, um, one other little detail that the migrations brought through, uh, the Sulois and the Aryans both used humanoids as mercenaries. Orcs, trolls, uh, giants never really existed here. Well, the giants did exist in the mountains, but, but most of them did not really exist in this part of the world until the wars brought them here, okay? And those uh, races have also settled in some areas. Uh, the, the, whole, uh, the Pomarge, for example, right here, is basically orcs, trolls, hobgoblins, goblins. This is a humanoid area, basically, just controlled by... Uh, there's also the bone marches here. Again, completely under the control of humanoids, okay? Uh, so what we've created here is an area where a person can draw up a character and be just about any ethnicity they want and fit in, okay? So what we have here, what we have here is a campaign, a fantasy role-playing campaign setting with a population, and here's the one that's going to piss you off, reflects the world we live in today. <laughs> and the, Gary Gygax did this in 1970 fucking seven. Okay? The same shit these people have been whining and bitching about. Oh, no, there's no diversity. There's no, there's no inclusion. I can't be whatever race I want in my Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, you could. You know, how, you know how I know you didn't play Dungeons and Dragons back then? Because yes, you could. Yes, you could. You're making shit up to be angry about. Spare me. Spare me, you're stupid. I have no time in my life for stupid. There is a campaign setting here published in 1977, which does exactly what you want it to do. It does exactly what you want it to do, except for one thing. It doesn't pretend that race doesn't exist. It treats it with intelligence. Because back then, when people played role-playing games, it was the smart kids. It hadn't been dumbed down for the masses at that point. But now, there's not supposed to be any mention of any of this. Wokeism is stupid. Don't be woke. Be awake. There's a huge difference. Woke, or as I like to call them, wokeists, or as I like to call them, woke scolds, which is really all they do is wag their finger at complete strangers that they don't even know, and just sit back and enjoy the smell of their own farts because they're better than these other people that are all obviously are not woke yet. <laughs> you can be anything you want. That's one of the reasons that Wizards of the Coast hates this campaign setting so much. Uh, the other one is that you don't really need a thousand books to play it. It's a very simple setting. Most of your antagonists are going to be humans. You don't need three different monster manuals. All they did eventually publish three different monster manuals. Good dungeon masters generally didn't use them. They would use some, maybe pick and choose a few creatures out of each one, but it didn't. It, it doesn't make sense to have that many intelligent races stuffed onto one planet. So as a general rule, uh, you didn't. You know, you could play this with the Monster Manual. The old Player's Handbook and the old Dungeon Master's Guide was all you needed. You didn't need, you know, a dozen... What, what are we up to? I don't even know. A hundred different classes? Right? 150 different subclasses? I mean, I don't know. What are we up to now? It's ridiculous, okay? No, you don't need that stuff to play this campaign setting, Okay? Uh, and you also can't be stupid, right? You actually have to, you have to read. You have to actually read the rules. I know that's a thing with fifth edition. You don't need to read the rules. <laughs> yeah, you can be a good dungeon master. You need to read the rules. Sorry, that's the way it is. So yeah, um, Gary Gygax gave us uh, a uh, campaign setting, which uh, looks remarkably like Seattle. 2023. Okay. Uh, the Backlunish, by the way, 
they are a very small element of this. Um, most of the Bechlonish went the other direction. And they created a different kingdom on the far side of the devastation, uh, which was never really made. It was never, there's no canon to it at this point. Uh, that they, uh, Gary Gygax had this great idea. Let's 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 create this new campaign setting. We'll call it Caratour, and we'll put it on the far side of the devastation, and that's where we can have the Oriental adventures take place. And uh, Cynthia Williams was like, uh, "Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, you're fired." <laughs> so it never really went anywhere. Yeah, most people don't realize that Caratour was never meant to be a part of Toril. It was always supposed to be, it was shoehorned into Toral. It was always supposed to be a part of this campaign setting. Um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, wokists, cry, cry more. And all you uh, anti-wokists who think that Gary Gygax was above creating a diverse and inclusive, cry more, okay? Because that's what this is. This is a diverse and inclusive Setting. It says right if you if you bother to actually read the the, the Greyhawk, uh, uh, the Greyhawk uh, uh, Gazetteer, the, the actual book. Okay, it says right in there. There's not a lot of pure bloods left. And there's been a lot of interbreeding done here. So yeah, uh, there's a little, and you know what? Those those places tend to be broken. Okay, uh, there's. The barbarians, right? There's Scarlet Brotherhood, a bunch of assassins, right? Uh, there's a few places left where the Flan have maintained their control. But there's no way they could have possibly maintained that level of control in such a diverse area without being a little racist, right? And that's one of the parts of my campaign. Uh, my campaign takes place in the Duchy of Ten. The Duchy of Ten is one of the Flannish areas, uh, and, but the, uh, the 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 nobil the royal families there, I mean, they'll only marry Flan. Is that the way that works? So, uh, if you were to say marry, oh, I don't know, an elf, and that's not pure Flan blood anymore, can you still be in the Flannish nobility? Well, in my campaign, the answer to that question is no. And that's one of the premises of my campaign. It takes place in a little town called Holstrom, which is in the hex where Halbert is, uh, Calbert is located. Calbert is a little town right up next to the mountains. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the House of Cambor is about to lose their estate uh, because Sir uh, 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 Arisa Cambor married an elf. And she is not allowed to do that. So her sons, who are half-elves, will not be allowed to take over that estate. And when Arissa Cambor dies, that's the end of the House of Cambor. That's not cool now, is it? Right? But that kind of thing had to happen in order for this Flannish stronghold to maintain itself as strictly Flannish which it has done. Um, there's other areas where that's happened as well. I told you about up here, uh, up, uh, up in the Barren Wastes area, the, uh, what's it called, the Rovers of the Barrens. And there's also the, uh, the Duchy of Geoff, okay? There's other areas too, which are pretty much exclusively Flannish. And over hundreds of years, that can't have maintained itself unless those noble families are showing a certain degree of ethnic uh, intolerance. Okay, so, yes, race exists. Yes, you can play any race you want. Yes, depending on where you are and what you are, you might have to face some prejudice. And that's why I chose the Duchy of Ten, because the Tenha are racist. Uh, and the players got to be at the, at, the, at, the bunt, at the butt end of that. Now, I assumed that uh, they would run. I assumed that they would beat their first couple of adventures and be in this place that was hostile to them because we had a, a dwarf, a gnome, an elf, a half-elf in the party. And, and we had several non-Flannish humans in the party. And 
I figured, well, they're going to get tired of being pushed around by this Flemish nobility and have their having their their rights and their ability to climb the social ladder restricted, and they'll leave and they'll head south uh, through the uh, the uh, theocracy of the Pale and into the Sheldamar Valley where things are more tolerant. That's why I named my campaign "Leaving Home." But players are players, and they will surprise you every time. And they have chosen not to do that. They have chosen to build a stronghold in 10, in the Duchy of 10. And they have chosen to stay there and help the people from the village that they know are in deep trouble because once the House of Canbor slips and loses control of the town, it's going to be, it's going to get a little ugly uh, for the people who live there because it is kind of a, uh, it's kind of a stronghold of inclusiveness and diversity. And uh, once uh, the new mayor, knight or baron moves in and takes over the house, uh, the, the estate, the estate uh, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Not to mention the fact that the, uh, you know, the whole area is under threat from humanoids and barbarians anyway. If you've read the starting module, uh, the starting module uh, B1, In Search of the Unknown, uh, one of the premises of that module is that there are barbarian scouts in Quas Catan kind of getting ready to invade the duchy again. It can be set, the, the can, module can be set in a number of different places, but the duchy of Tenha is one of their suggested starting locations, and it is, in my opinion, the one that makes the most sense, so that's where I put it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there you have it. Not woke, awake. Okay, so that's it. I've had my rant. So again, if you want to uh, recruit me to your cause of wokeism, go fuck yourself. If you want to recruit me to your cause of anti-wokeism, go fuck yourself. I, I'm not. I don't even want. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue about that shit with people. It's not worth it. It's it's it's, it's literally. The, you know. You know why the corporations have embraced wokeism? Because it gives them a chance to look like the good guys without spending any money. And guess whose job it is to keep us arguing with each other all the time? Now, I guess it's starting to cost them a little more money than they hoped. So we might see some changes there. <laughs> They've got to ask Disney to carry the flag for a long time. And the company's about to go into the toilet for their trouble. And, uh, you know, companies, uh, regardless of of the agendas of the leadership, the CEO, the, 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 the chief operating officer, the, you know, the big wigs, the board. There are stockholders, and stockholders will not tolerate extended periods of uh, you know, unprofitability. So there's only so much even the corporations can do uh, when they're losing money. And right now, Disney's wokeism is really costing them a lot of money. I think we'll see that start to ease up a little bit. All it's got to have, what's got to happen, see the problem with the stockholders is a lot of them are idiots too, you know? The, the stockholders are mostly dumb money, right? So, so they, they just, they're, they're along, they're along for the ride. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> but uh, some of them are not dumb money. Some of them actually are in this to make money. Uh, what's going to happen is the price is going to go down far enough that some shark is going to come in there and buy a lot of stock and become an active investor. And uh, that active investor is going to want to see some changes. And if you buy enough stock, you have the power to do that. So it's only a matter of time before somebody turns Disney around. It's all, you know, like I said, they, the, the corporations have one agenda, but the investors, they only have one agenda, and that's make money. So sooner or later, the Disney campaign will fold. You know what really bugs me about wokeism? It's not woke. It's not awake. It's not. If you are really interested in, in creating an environment of inclusiveness and diversity, you don't take a white guy and turn him into a black woman. That's not how you do it. Okay? You don't just race or gender swap your existing characters. You tell new stories. You tell unique stories about new people, unique people, right? 
and, and the, the sad thing is they've done it, and they've done it successfully. Uh, they've done it with Mulan, the cartoon, not the live action. The live action is nonsense. But the cartoon, Mulan, that was a good movie. I mean, that was a hero's journey with a woman, Asian woman, as the lead. And it worked. It was good. It was a good movie. She, she came in someplace and she faced adversity and she, she got up and dusted herself off after her initial defeat and she went on and she became strong and she became capable and she kicked some very serious ass at the end of that movie, right? That's the hero's journey, right? Good movie. Uh, what's that other one? I didn't really watch the whole thing. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't really watch the whole thing. It's not my cup of tea, but The Princess and the Frog, right? Right? That's a culturally and ethnically diverse story. So it can be done, and it has been done. It has been done profitably. Uh, and I'm not sure if the problem is that Disney is just completely devoid of any real crea creative talent now. It's entirely possible. They seem to have chased all their talented writers away. Uh, and they certainly aren't willing to pay for talent. Uh, but... Uh, I'm not sure if that's the problem, or if they have some, like I said, some other, if they're really just doing this to keep us pissing on each other, right? Uh, because, you know, like I said, the corporations are, they're invested in keeping us arguing amongst ourselves about things that don't matter. And wokeism is one of those things that won't cost them any money. We can argue about it till we're blue in the face, and as long as we're not asking for more health care, it's not going to cost them anything as long as we're not asking for better wages. It's not going to cost them anything. So, yeah, I mean, where do I stand on wokeism? I think it's all bullshit. I think it's all bullshit. I think it's a, a fantasy that was conjured up for the sake of keeping the ignorant masses blaming each other and arguing with each other. And whatever you do, whatever you do, 